Wow, this is just an, an incredibly humbling experience. I can't tell you how deeply honored I am to be chosen to lead such an impressive group of professionals. It's an important day in my professional life. It's also an important day in the Smith family history. 25 years ago, the Society of Ad Actuaries had its annual meeting in Chicago. Karen and I attended. The program was excellent, except Tuesday afternoon was a little weak. As a direct result of this, nine short months later, <laughs> our only child, Emily, entered the world. Now, I don't want any of you guys to get any ideas about this afternoon's program, but there are many forms of continuing education. The Society of Actuaries has had its typically outstanding year. Exams have been administered, meetings have been offered and attended by its members, continuing education opportunities have been ma made available, and valuable research has been produced. Truth be told, this happens year after year, not because of the presidential office of the SOA, but rather because we are blessed with having a generous core of volunteers and excellent staff led by Fred or Greg Heydrich and Stacy Lynn. If I ask our volunteers to stand, virtually everyone in the room would do so, so I won't. However, if you're a member of this SOA staff, please stand so we can express our appreciation for your continuously excellent effort on behalf of the actual profession. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do not intend to take up this valuable time with you outlining the accomplishments of the SOA this past year. Rather, I want to talk about the actuarial profession, the opportunities we have, the challenges we face, and the structure we operate under. I recognize in advance that many of my comments and examples will be more relevant to our US-based members, but I believe the issues I raise and the directions I'm suggesting will, if taken, directly benefit our members in the U United States, Canada, and many other parts of the world where we have members and candidates today. The challenge for any profession is to remain relevant to all of its stakeholders. So it is with the actuarial profession. We do this by committing to lifelong learning, replenishing the technical skills that are an amortizing asset but represent the lifeblood of our expertise. We also remain relevant by developing skills outside our areas of expertise, working on our weaknesses as well as our strengths, improving our soft skills. I am reminded of the presentation by Professor Paul Emirates at last year's annual meeting. Dr. Emirates is a professor of mathematics and economics. He gave a fascinating presentation on how he, he used his technical skills to predict the mortgage and financial crisis of 2008, well in advance of its occurrence. He described how he tried to warn regulators and government officials of this impending calamity, how they largely ignored him as being too academic. In fact, he showed a slide with those two words on the screen. He wore the label as a badge of honor. It was a fascinating presentation, one well worth our time. I was certainly impressed, but something bothered me as I left that presentation. I couldn't put my finger on it immediately, but it struck me a few days later. What should have been his most significant professional achievement, predicting and help to, helping to avoid or at least minimize the disastrous effects of a coming worldwide financial meltdown, turned into a humongous professional failure. Think about it. He had the skills and technical ability to predict this coming calamity, but because he lacked the ability to communicate effectively with a non-academic audience, he could not help the world avoid the pain and suffering it eventually caused and is continuing to cause today. Have you ever been accused of being too actuarial? I certainly have. I used to wear it as a badge of honor also. Until someone pointed out to me that they were not criticizing the necessarily highly complicated and technical nature of the work that actuaries do, but rather my inability to communicate the issues on a, in a non-technical fashion to non-actuaries. This represented a professional deficiency as critical as not having the technical ability to develop the solution. 
If you cannot articulate the problem you're trying to solve and the solution you are proposing, you will fail as a professional or at least fall short of your potential. I have been a consultant for over 25 years. The clients have ignored my advice? Absolutely. We need to recognize that we're not always right, that there are elements to any solution that we may not appreciate, that we are not always the smartest person in the room. Having said that, we must also recognize that if this happens too often, clients will eventually stop asking our opinions. We will become irrelevant. This is so important now because depending upon your point of view, we are either, either blessed or burdened with enormous societal problems that have substantial actuarial components. The funding, of, uh, the funding and potential reform of Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, health care reform, the underfunding of public pension plans. Let's talk about some of these issues. Underfun the underfunding of public pension plans. This topic has garnered much publicity over the last year. Many of our largest public pension plans are severely underfunded. This underfunding represents a substantial financial burden on future generations of taxpayers. To formulate a solution, the root causes of the problem must be understood. We know the causes, but we have failed to communicate them effectively to the general public. First, sponsors have failed to fund the plans at the level recommended by the, their actuaries. This is understandable. Tax revenues are down due to the financial crisis. There are pressing needs other than pension plans that must be funded on a current basis. Education, transportation, health care, to name a few. Many of these plans already have billions of dollars of assets invested. Why should they pay more into these plans when they have more pressing current needs? It is our role as actuaries to answer that question. Given the reality of funding at a level substantially less than recommended, it's clear that in some cases we have not been as effective as we need to be. Number two, the investment returns of the past decade have been calamitous. Equities have severely underperformed their historical level. Additionally, markets have been very volatile. This has led to an asymmetric response to these volatile returns by plan sponsors. What do I mean by this? In the late 1990s and early 2000s, during the dot-com bubble, investment returns greatly exceeded expectations. This led to overfunding of some plans. Assuming that those returns were not an aberration, but plan sponsors raised benefits, which once gra granted are typically guaranteed. When the bubble imploded, the excess returns disappeared, and due to it, at least in part, to increase in benefits that became guaranteed, the plans were left severely underfunded. Number three, politicians appealed to public employees by promising increases in their benefits, knowing that such increases would be funded, substantially funded in the future after they had left office. Number four, plan administrators of final average pay defined benefit plans allowed the spiking of benefit levels by certain employees near retirement to work additional overtime in years immediately prior to retirement. Number five, early retirement of older, higher paid employees were replaced by younger, lesser paid employees was seen as a way to reduce current payroll without recognizing the impact that these early retirements would have on the funded status of the pension plans. And finally, number six, post-retirement health costs were either not funded at all or were funded at a level well before their, uh, below their expected cost. Earlier in the year, I was interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times concerning the funding of public pension plans. While I'm not, not a pension actuary by training, my commercial responsibilities require me to be aware of these issues. A 15-minute introductory interview turned into a 90-minute discussion in which we talked about each of these underlying causes. At the end of the interview, she told me that she had been working on this story for a number of months and that I was only one of two actuaries willing to discuss the causes of the problem. No one else would discuss it on the record. In a subsequent conversation, she told me that she understands the underlying causes of the underfunded status of these plans, but then she said something very interesting. She said, Brad, you seem like a smart guy. You are a leader of the actuarial profession. You must recognize that once the level of underfunding is understood by the public, people will be pointing fingers at the actuarial profession. I do, and so do you. 
all the more reason for the actuarial profession to be part of the solution rather than be viewed as part of the problem. A quick side note, my sister is a middle school teacher in Illinois. I come from a family of teachers. She wrote a letter to her state representative urging her to not reduce the benefits she had worked for throughout her career. The representative's response was instructive. She said she was empathetic to my sister's concerns, but the state finances were so bad, it appeared clear that the benefits for state employees would have to be reduced. She then made it clear that as a newly elected representative, she was not responsible for the poorly funded plan. Rather, it was the responsibility of her predecessors and the advisors they relied upon. Yes, they will blame us. Let's talk about health care reform. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, PPACA, is undeniably a very complicated piece of legislation. One of its elements that will affect actuaries in our work are the four primary subsidies the law creates among different constituencies. Let me preface these remarks by saying that I am in no way criticizing Congress or President Obama. It's the legislature's responsibility to determine who should pay for what and whether differentiation by, uh, of cost by a given criteria is socially acceptable or desirable. Let's talk about the four subsidies. The four subsidies created by the legislation are affluent to poor, healthy to unhealthy via the elimination of underwriting, young male to young female, and to a lesser extent, older female to older male via the elimination of gender-based pricing. And number four, young to old via the three to one limitation on pricing. While any of one of us may disagree with the social benefits of such, such subsidies, it's pretty clear what the underlying thinking was on at least the first three. However, I was having a problem understanding the four why the fourth subsidy was enacted. After all, Many of the uninsured are young adults who feel invulnerable and do not see the need to purchase health insurance. The new law requires them to purchase insurance or pay a penalty. If we're going to subsidize any age group, shouldn't we be subsidizing them? Instead, not only are we not subsidizing them, we are forcing them to pay artificially high premiums that subsidize an older, generally more affluent cohort. This didn't make sense to me. I discussed it with someone who works on Capitol Hill. I told him I understood the criteria for the first three, but was struggling to understand the reason for the young to old subsidy. Were Congress and the President trying to emulate the group insurance market? Were they making a statement about the appropriateness of age-based pricing? The person just looked at me and smiled. He said, Brad, you're such an actuary. You try to impute logic where there is none. There is one reason and one reason alone for the three to one limit that subsidizes the old at the expense of the young. I said, okay, what is it? What's the reason? He said it is the price that AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, extracted for their support of the bill. It is the price that AARP extracted to support the bill. Totally non-actuarial, totally political, Old people vote, young people don't. If you're under age 35, this should make you angry. I'm 56 and it makes me angry. There's a lesson here for us as a profession. If we are to sit at the grown-ups table, we have to recognize that, we, not, that not all decisions are driven by actuarial considerations. We are not always the smartest people in the room. In fact, in some ways, we have been the most ignorant or at least the most naive. One final po point on this topic. There are ramifications to moving from our current environment to one that is subsidized in a di different way. And, and as professionals, we should not be shy about pointing out these ramifications. The newly subsidized co subsidizing cohort, young, healthy, middle-class males, are gonna be hit with substantial rate increases as a direct result of the mandated subsidies in this legislation. The laws of actuarial science, like the laws of physics and economics, are immutable. Since we were talking about health care, let's move on to Medicare. We all know the problem. The current level and trajectory of the growth of health care costs are at unsustainable levels. The causes have been well documented. Waste, fraud, overutilization have resulted in health care costs in excess of 16 to 17 percent of gross domestic product. Behavioral economics shows that humans react to incentives. 
The current health care delivery system incents health care professionals to provide more, not necessarily more effective medicine. Advent advances in medicine and the use of technology allows us to do things medically that were unimaginable even a decade ago. Historically, we have adop adopted new treatments that were demonstrated to be better than existing treatments, regardless of the incremental cost. One lesson of the financial crisis is we now recognize that we have finite resources. Choices have to be made. The issue is not whether the individual is free to pursue whatever protocol of treatment he or she wish wishes. The issue is what level of coverage will be provided by the publicly provided plan, and what additional coverage is the individual responsible for purchasing. The issue of making choices is a hot one politically. Death panels comes to mind. However, when asked whether, a medi would, whether Medicare should pay for a 94-year-old 90 patient with severe Alzheimer's disease to have a knee replacement, most people would say no. That is not an efficient use of our finite resources. Once you have made that decision, you have crossed the conceptual threshold. You have acknowledged there are certain procedures that, that will not be for, performed based upon a cost-benefit analysis. The only question is where is the line to be drawn? Difficult questions, difficult choices, but ones that must be asked, answered, and made if we were to, to control the trajectory of runaway health care costs. Actuaries have the skills necessary to participate in research that will help society make some of these tough choices. Social Security. Social Security was designed as a pay-as-you-go system. The 1990, or 1983 reform resulted in increased taxes and decreased benefits to assure the 75-year solvency of Social Security. The resultant tax revenue excessive benefit payments accumulated in the Social Security Trust Fund. The federal government borrowed this excess revenue to pay current expenses. It also contributed to the reduction in the government's current deficit and external debt. Nonetheless, the federal government owes this money to the Social Security Trust Fund, which now sits at approximately $2.6 trillion. In the near future, absent reform, Social Security benefit payments will permanently overtake Social Security tax revenue, resulting in an increase in the government's current deficit calculated on a unified basis. Given the level of the government's deficit, this has led some politicians to call for a reform of, the, of Social Security. However, we know that any reform of Social Security will not affect the government deficit over the long run as Social Security taxes paid to pay so, or must be used to pay Social Security benefits. It is a zero-sum game. Likewise, once the trust fund is dissipated and the taxes collected are no longer adequate to pay scheduled benefits, benefits will be reduced to the level supported by then current tax revenue. This is primarily due to the Democrat graphic shift gener generated by the retirement of the baby boom generation. Actuaries understand this. The general public does not. Reform is necessary not to help address the deficit issue, but rather to distribute the pain of some combination of increased taxes and reduced benefits more equitably to all tax-paying generations. Absent such reform, the generations paying taxes through the mid-2030s and receiving the precipitously reduced benefits resulting from the dissipation of the trust fund will bear the economic brunt caused by this demographic shift. Steve Goss, the chief actuary of Social Security, and his staff have done an excellent job of detailing this issue. The actuarial profession needs to support their efforts to better educate the taxpaying public and lawmakers so we can create a system that is fair to all. These societal issues represent a significant and growing opportunity for the actuarial profession. We are blessed with superior analytical skills necessary to address these issues. However, because we are blessed, we have a tremendous responsibility. Are we the cause of these problems? I maintain that we are not. However, if we do not become part of the solution, we risk becoming facil facilitators of the problems. This is something that few, if any, of us want to live with. We must become more active participants in developing solutions to these problems. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking every actuary to speak out about these issues, 
at cocktail parties, at neighborhood barbecues, at family gatherings, at your place of work. I'm asking you to give presentations to your local community club, to write your congressman, to write letters to the editor of your local newspaper, to tap the power of social media, media be it Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, to deliver this message. I've asked the society staff to create PowerPoint presentations on each of these four topics targeted to non-actuarial audiences that will be made available to you to alter and use as you deem appropriate. Incidentally, the Academy has developed some very helpful issue papers on these and other topics to help educate you and the general public. They're available on their website. I encourage you to take a look. One of the impediments to the actuarial profession becoming more substantial contributors to solving these issues is the structure of our professional organizations in the United States. I completed my term as vice president of the SOA in 2003. When I left, the organizations were reasonably co cooperative and productive, minimizing the impact of the artificially complex structure. Since becoming int more intimately involved this last year, I've observed that our organizations are less cooperative and much more competitive with each other. The markets our members and candidates face are much more competitive also. Both from a credential and training stamp, uh, credentials and training outside the profession, for example, the CFA, MBA, Masters in Finance, and other credentials. And let's face it, the SOA and the CAS compete for students with other global actuarial organizations. I sat in a meeting a couple weeks ago in which a leader of another global actuarial organization acknowledged that they have one very distinct competitive advantage over the SOA. Specifically, they offer education and examination for all actuarial disciplines, whereas the SOA does not support the casualty or non-life insurance discipline. They have a similar competitive advantage over the CAS. Clearly, we are stronger competing together rather than separately. We must restructure our organizations in a way that concentrates and focuses our resources on ensuring that the profession, our professional associations, and our credentials remain strong and grow stronger in the future. For the profession to have a meaningful impact on critical policy, uh, public policy issues, we must have a highly focused, coordinated effort with the scale and resources necessary to that effort. We actually already have the scale and those resources, but we divide them among a variety of different organizations. To be more effective, we should focus and concentrate our efforts. In the past couple of years, we have received a message from many of the large employer, employers of, of actuaries that our existing structure is both inefficient and ineffective. The markets in which our employers work are highly competitive and becoming more so. Economic pressure for cost savings is requiring a number of our major employers to combine and achieve efficiencies in new ways, and they will also eventually require it of us. In the long run, we cannot avoid this economic reality. At a time when we most need concentrated, focused effort, we spend hours and days of precious volunteer leadership and staff time and effort finding ways to collaborate with one another and we duplicate our spending on many aspects of our separate infrastructures. These efforts are well-meaning, but they are aimed almost solely at making our divided and disparate systems work. There's a hesitancy to do anything due to a fear of stepping on others' toes. I believe we can put those volunteer leaders, staff, and financial resources to more effective use and gain important efficiencies as well. The Society of Actuaries members, when asked to vote on a proposal to combine and make more efficient just one aspect of this structure, the recent joint disciplinary proposal, voted by a margin of 94% to 6% in favor. Over 80% of the CAS voters made, uh, had the same view as did 93% of the Candy Academy members who voted and 93% of the CCA voting members. In other words, you, our members, strongly supported such a efficiencies. Many of the profession's leaders and its employers in private conversations and public statements have expressed the view that a more efficient and rational structure for the U.S. profession makes sense. Several of them have tried in various ways over the years to achieve change. Steve Kellison, former president of the Society and former executive director of the Academy, stated in an article in the October 2005 issue of the Actuary, 
Put simply, there are too many actuarial organizations for a profession of our relatively small size. Our overall organization structure collectively is too complex and the end result is suboptimal. I see this largely, perhaps uniquely, as a problem facing the profession in the United States. Steve went on to say, there's no strategic vision for the profession as a whole. Despite repeated good faith attempts to define who is responsible for what, lack of clarity still pervades everything we do. Effectiveness and efficiency are difficult to achieve under the current structure. The current structure requires a lot of communication and coordination. Every hour spent in coordination and communication activity is an hour not spent actually doing something to advance the goals of the profession. Competition among the organizations invariably arises. He concluded, to the world outside our profession, we appear to be a fractured, convoluted, even disorganized profession. That's what Steve said six years ago. We cannot tolerate or afford to operate under this structure for the next six years. The critical review of the U.S. Actuarial Professions Report, CRUSAP, prepared by a committee of senior actuaries chaired by Fred Kilborn to address new challenges facing the profession, stated in late 2006, the organizational structure of the profession results in a significant distraction to the profession's leadership at a time when it is facing unprecedented challenges in meeting its goal to better serve the public. The, the current organization structure is an impediment to, the effect, to an effective voice for the profession. Accordingly, we recommend that the actual profession establish the consolidation of the actual profession as a long-term goal. In the intervening years, a number of our leaders have attempted to address these issues. In, most, in the most recent election, several of our candidates for president-elect also expressed the view that structural change is needed. Our current structure is not positioned to compete in the global marketplace. It is expensive, inefficient, and substantially less effective than it could be. Quite frankly, almost everyone that works and has worked within the system recognizes this. Don Siegel calls it the elephant in the room. It seems clear that 10 years from now, this structure will no longer be in place. This has been my experience in the commercial world that if you know you are destined to go a certain direction eventually, you're better off getting there sooner rather than later. As, I've, as I have outlined this afternoon, we have much on our plate. We have a great responsibility. In order to meet that responsibility, we need to simplify our profession's organizational structure. There is absolutely no need for three separate professional organizations, the Society of Actuaries, the CAS, and the American Academy to exist. They need to consolidate into one efficient, effective organization. I know there are historical differences among our organizations. And I know there were good reasons many years ago why they were created. However, I believe, and I think the, major, the vast majority of you agree with me, that the time is past when we should let our history dictate the future structure of our profession. The challenges we face as a profession and as a nation are simply too great for us not to respond with a new approach. Despite the obvious difficulty, I intend to address this, this issue. I'm prepared to focus energy and time during my term as president seeking this change even as we continue serving members and candidates in our current structure. Although the Society Board has not expressed any view on this matter, I've had significant conversations with a number of our board members, including all of our presidential officers, who are fully supportive of this direction. In the near future, I plan to formally ask our board to support my efforts to make our profession's organization structure more rational, more efficient, and more effective, much as a previous generation of SOA leaders did in 1949. Based upon discussions and other communications with some of, our lead, uh, some of the leaders of other U.S.-based actuarial organizations over the past year, it is clear that many of them believe this is the time to simplify our profession's organizational structure. To, uh, today, I am asking the leaders of these actuarial organizations, principally the, the Academy and the CAS, to join me in this effort for the good of the profession, its members and candidates, and the stakeholders we serve. I would also welcome the participation in such an effort by the CCA and ACOPA at any level that they deem appropriate.
today I am asking the members of the Society of Actuaries and the employers of its members who I believe strongly support this idea to express their views in support of this objective both to me and to the leaders of the other organizations and to encourage them to participate in this effort. Write emails, express your view on the various blogs that exist, contact the members of the boards of these organizations, get the word out to members not at this meeting, use social media, call for chains, let's assure that the relevancy of the actuarial profession in the foreseeable future, let's commit to, to, to do more to contribute to the solution of society's problems. I'm committed to lead these efforts, but I need your help. It's up to you. Inertia is our biggest obstacle. Those who do not want this change will certainly be the most vocal. Let your voices be heard. I welcome your suggestion. Let's not leave this earth knowing we could have done better. Thank you very much. Thank you.